Hey everyone, I'm a huge fan of all scary things, and even the unexplained. I even have my own YouTube channel, where I post interviews that I have done with people who have experienced any sort of paranormal activity. However, there is one thing that I've always been, well, quite a skeptic about, and that is skinwalkers. I mean, witches who transform into animals? and apparently are only confined to a specific area within America. To me it always sounded like the typical legends and stories about the boogeyman, you know, that parents tell you about. However, there are some events that have been happening that have actually made me doubt everything. And now I'm sharing this story so that you all can avoid what I did and also see if anyone out there can actually help me. My friend Zanny is of Navajo descent. He always shared cultural insights and stories of the res with me. It was during one of our discussions over text that he first introduced me to the legends of the skinwalkers. He said something about shape-shifting humans. And with curiosity, I gladly accepted his invite to visit the res. Being a YouTuber or media creator, I plan to stay for a week hoping to go deeper into these stories, do some research, capture photos of notable sites, and gather first-hand accounts from the locals. The res was unlike any place I've been to. With its landscapes perfect for photos, it was both beautiful and eerie. Over the first few days, I kept finding myself busy from visiting the local trading post, hanging out at community events, I learned about their daily lives, taking photos and setting up casual interviews with all sorts of people and the locals about these so-called skinwalkers. However, of course, the people of the rest met my questions about skinwalkers with different reactions. Some would actually cast their eyes downward, offering nothing more than a no comment. Others stared back with a stern look warning me of the consequences of prying too deep into the things that are best left alone. Yet, a few brave souls did share stories about so-called coyotes who transform into humans. Apparently, they can mimic certain voices and animal sounds. How one should not whistle at night, as it's believed that this might actually invite or summon a skinwalker. So during my time there, I stayed in the Hogan that belonged to Sani's grandma. But at the moment, nobody was staying in it, except for Sani. For those unfamiliar, a Hogan is a traditional Navajo dwelling place. Constructed from a mixture of logs, there's actually some spiritual significance for the Navajo. It's almost like you can feel a connection to the land. And the door to the Hogan always faces east to greet the morning sun which apparently is important in their daily rituals and traditions. After my string of interviews and questions on the res, words seemed to have traveled fast. On the fifth day of my stay, I was outside the Hogan trying to capture photos of the beautiful sunset when I noticed an older man approaching. He moved with a slow pace and his clothing was traditional and around his neck were hanging all sorts of amulets that were making noise with each step that he took. Zanny, who had been inside the Hogan, stepped out and immediately went silent upon seeing this man. He whispered to me, that's Tahoma, one of the respected medicine men around these parts. Before I could ask more, Tahoma was already within earshot. His piercing eyes, set deep and locked with mine, you're the one asking about those whom walk on all fours, he stated, more than ask. I hesitated for a moment, taken back by his statement. Uh, yeah, I am, I admit it, extending my hand in greeting. I'm just curious about the legends and he ignored my hand, cutting me off with a stern. Curiosity can lead to places from where there's no return. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. I was trying to keep the conversation going. Hey, no disrespect. I'm just here to learn more about the culture and the stories. 
Tahoma stared deep into my eyes, as if he was studying my words. After what felt like an eternity, he spoke in a grave tone. There are things on this land that you don't understand, that you cannot comprehend, with your questions and your cameras. You awaken things best left, undisturbed. I gulped, the weight of his words pressing down on me. Hey man, I apologize if I offended or overstepped, I said. He leaned in closer, and with a hushed voice filled with urgency, he warned, leave this place. They have taken notice of you, and they don't like you watching them. With that, he turned and walked away, leaving behind the silence. My friend, looking as pale as I felt, said, when Tahoma speaks, we listen. I've been trying to tell you that these things are real, man. That night, the environment of the Hogan felt different, more ominous, if anything. Every small noise outside made me jump, and the once comfortable walls felt suffocating. I couldn't shake off the medicine man's warning, even though, to be honest, I didn't believe him. Despite the tension that hung in the air that night, a part of me still doubted most of these things. I hadn't personally witnessed any evidence of skinwalkers or the supernatural during my stay so far. And stories and legends were one thing, but tangible proof was another thing. The medicine man's warning, a little scary I will admit, could just be a way to dissuade outsiders like me from prying too deep into Navajo traditions, I thought. I'm not gonna lie, that night, all the skinwalker talk had me a bit on edge. I guess the fact of being out here kind of didn't help. I had to use the restroom so I stepped out the Hogan and walked towards the dimly lit outhouse. As I was sitting down remembering that next time to not indulge in other cultural food so quickly, the distant sounds of the wilderness were interrupted by other noises that I started to hear which were soft footsteps. The rustle of brush nearby and the quiet creak of shifting dirt, it felt as if someone or something was slowly circling the outhouse, each footstep sounding closer than the last. Drawing in a silent breath, I waited, heart pounding, straining my eyes to see any trace of movement through the small cracks in the wooden structure but I didn't see anything. Then, a tap at the door. Keep in mind this was around 11 at night, so I said out loud, Hey, I'm in here. No response. Then, I heard what sounded like, perhaps a dog scampering away on all fours, with the running steps fading into the distance. Well, that was weird, I thought. As I finished up handling my business, I slowly unlatched the door and stepped out, cautiously scanning the darkness. I kid you not, as soon as I took two, three steps from behind me, I felt a force clamp down on my shoulder, causing me to jump nearly out of my skin. That's when I turned around and I saw it. The face of Zanny, with a roaring sound and then a loud laugh. Catching my breath and shaking my head, I said, Well, all right, you got me, dude. I admit it. He started to laugh, throwing an arm around my shoulders as we began to walk back to the Hogan. You have to admit, he began, sweeping an arm out and pointing to the landscape. The rest is beautiful out here at night. Without the bright city lights, everything feels more alive, more connected. I took a moment to appreciate the beauty around us. The clear sky filled with numerous stars. It's beautiful out here, Sani, but I do want to let you know, it feels like we're the only ones out here. Some of these stories, legends, they just seem like traditions to be honest, passed down to make sure that everybody respects the land. He looked at me, then nodded. Well, that's fair, but some traditions are born from truth that has actually been forgotten. Sani said as we continue our walk back to the Hogan. On my last night at the res, I decided to indulge in a bit of mischief and to get back at Sani for the prank he pulled. 
While heading back from the outhouse again, I tiptoe around the Hogan, tapping gently on its walls and trying to mimic the eerie skinwalker sounds I heard they made. I was hoping that maybe Sani would start reciting a prayer that he told me that the people do whenever there's a skinwalker around. I was waiting to see if Sani came out when I noticed little bundles near the Hogan's base. With curiosity, I took out my phone and captured a few pictures, thinking it would add a unique touch to my video. And nearby, I saw stones, fixed in a way that seemed to be a ritual circle. I moved a few rocks to get a better picture. Then, laughing quietly to myself, and seeing that Sani was not reacting to this, I began to whistle. And then, in a mocking demonic voice, I called out, Sani, it is I who walk on all fours. There was only silence. And after about five more minutes, and seeing that he still wasn't coming, I decided to take some last final shots of the beautiful landscape, as I knew this was my last night there. When I finally returned inside, Sani was there, snoring away. I chuckled to myself thinking, well, if a real skinwalker ever shows up, you'll be of no help with that deep sleep. The next morning I said bye to Zanny and his grandma and thanked them for their hospitality. I also told Zanny I would contact him once I put a video together and that before publishing, I would send it to him to make sure he was okay with it. When I returned home to edit some of the videos and pictures, I noticed that something was off. In the background of many interviews were shadows flickering in and out of the frame. Even when I was trying to edit some of the interviews I had done, the audio itself sounded distorted with what sounded like whispering echoes behind the words of those whom I interviewed. However, it was the pictures that really disturbed me. Every single image that I had taken, even in the daylight, had a faint shadow figure growing more and more clear with each picture and the most scary picture was the last few that I took after rearranging those stones the picture was supposed to be of the landscape but instead there was a blurry silhouette of what looked to be a person it had elongated limbs and also a twisted unnatural posture nervously I contacted Zanny and after explaining everything, he went quiet, saying that he would ask the local medicine man for advice. The next day Zanny called, his voice sounded worried. He told me I might have caught the attention of something and that he's communicating with Tahoma, the medicine man to perform a ceremony. They believe it might help cleanse whatever I had caught the attention of. That same night, as I was asleep in my room, I was awoken by what sounded like whistling outside my window. I woke up half asleep, and I swear, I heard a voice coming from my closet, saying, I'm in here, mimicking my response that I gave when I was in the bathroom that night in the res. I'm posting this here because, out of all the places on the internet, I figure this community might be the most understanding. If anyone knows what I can do to make things right, or how to protect myself, please let me know. I will provide an update tomorrow once Sani tells me how the ceremony went. But please, take this serious. I'm starting to panic as I'm typing this. And I swear, every time I glance at the dim reflection on my PC, when I change a window or tab, that distorted, twisted figure from that last photo I took seems to be standing right behind me. I'm pretty new to this, but I just have to get this out there. I have to tell someone about this, and I felt like this was the best place to tell people. This all started when I used to live in a small town in Arkansas with a population around 5,000 plus people. 
It was a typical average conservative town. In the summers it was hot and humid and in the winter it was dark and cold. I grew up on southern entertainment, driving four wheelers and hunting every deer season and maybe some small trapping here and there. But this happened during my last year of high school. I was 17 at the time. I had a girlfriend, lots of friends, and a shabby 1972 Ford pickup that I still have to this day. Anyways, it was November. Rifle season had just started and I had been getting ready for it. My friend, his name is Drew, and I had been planning this trip for months and we had everything ready. It was Friday, the end of the week and the start of the weekend. Our plan was to hike up through the national forest onto the mountain and set up camp and just have a good time. I wish I could have done something to have stopped myself. I woke up at 3 in the morning, leaving a note for my parents and putting my things in the bed of my truck. I hopped in and drove to my friend's house. He was already waiting for me outside. I got out and said in a whisper, You have all your things? I don't want to forget anything. Yeah, yeah I, checked I checked again, again before, before you got, got here. here. He said, he put his bag in my bed and put his gun in the truck and we took off to the mountain. I had my eyes fixed on the road and Drew was sitting there with a metal click and I looked over and he was flicking a lighter on and off. What's that? I said, putting my eyes back on the road. Oh, it's, oh, it's my, my grandfather's, grandfather's lighter. lighter. He had it with him all throughout the war. We then turned and went through the entrance to the hiking site. The change from road to dirt was just as familiar as ever. We stopped and got out. We put on our bags and headed up the mountain trails. It was around 7 and we could see where we were going because the sun was coming over the trees. The birds were chirping and I could see the squirrels running through the trees chattering. Three hours of hiking later, we came up the campsite that we followed with our map. When we got there, we quickly set up our tarps and we were quick to find firewood and to start a fire. I told my friend that I would get us some lunch and I headed off with my rifle to go get something to eat. I walked for at least half a mile south and found myself breaking the tree line. I decided I would sit and watch for a bit. I sat underneath the large oak tree and looked for any movement. The sun was rising slowly. I was sitting there when all the birds stopped for a moment. The silence was deafening. The sharp ringing in my ear was eerie. I scanned slowly with my eyes only, staying as still as possible. That's when I saw movement across the field. It was hard to make out. I slowly raised my rifle and looked down the hill. A deer had poked its head out of the tree line. I only saw its head and neck from where I was at. I knew it was risky to take a shot, but I also knew I wouldn't have another chance to bag another deer. Regardless, it was a doe anyhow. That's when I noticed something. The deer's head was higher off the ground than most deer should be. I felt like it was watching me. It slowly turned to the left. I could only see its neck and shoulders. And I could hear leaves crunching as it moved deep into the dark forest. A little nervous, I decided to head back to camp. I followed the mental landmarks that I saw the first time. A tree that had fell over, dried up creek bed, and I could see the tarps in the distance through the trees. When I got back to the campsite, we decided it was time to catch up on some sleep. I crawled into my tent and got in my sleeping bag and fell asleep. We got up early that morning. It was still as eerie as it was the day before. It just felt so weird, different. No animals in the area, just silence. It was strange. The air felt heavy. There were no birds anywhere, no deer, rabbits, or anything. Not even any crows crying out. We were getting hungry, and when the sun set, we nestled down waiting for some game to come around. It soon grew dark again and we decided to come together and to make some beans that I had packed just in case we didn't catch anything. As we were getting everything ready, my friend Drew got up from his seat and said, I'll be right back. I gotta take a piss. I sat there drinking my water, watching the fire dance. After some time, I noticed that Drew 
had been gone for a while. That's when I started to get concerned, and I heard leaves crunching, and I jumped and looked towards where the sound came from, and it was Drew. However, his face was pale. Dude, come over here, he said. What's over there? Just come over here and look, Drew said as I got up to follow him into the darkness of the forest. As I was walking, I started smelling something horrible, something pungent, and it got stronger and stronger as we walked deeper into the woods. The smell was so bad, and then, as I was walking, something fell on my shoulder. I turned my head to see what it was, but the smell of death made my stomach churn. I leaned over and started to throw up, while this thing that was on my shoulder fell to the floor. It hit the ground with a sickening, squishy sound. I pulled out my light and pointed it to the ground. I got confused for a second when a drop of blood fell on my hand. I looked up and my heart skipped a beat. What I saw was disturbing. The guts of an animal, limbs, pieces. A squirrel that had been impaled on a branch. What was left of it at least. I looked at the face of Drew still drained of all color his mouth was open eyes wide dude what the fuck i said and that's when we just ran and bolted back to the campsite how did they get up that high in the tree why were they on the branches maybe we should leave i said i agree i don't want to stay here anymore man drew said we started shoving our food and things back into the trail packs that's when we heard crunching a few yards away from us in the pitch black darkness of the forest. And Drew aimed his shotgun at the sound, and I slowly raised my rifle. I pulled out the mag light and pointed it to where we heard the sound. We were about 8 yards away from where we heard it. I flicked on the flashlight, and a deer was leaning, its head out beside a tree next to some brush. With some relief, we lowered our guns, and that's when the deer suddenly fell to the floor. The deer's head rolled down the hill and stopped in front of us. Something had ripped or chewed the deer's head off and rolled it down the hill. But that wasn't the reason I was scared. Someone had been holding the deer's head and then everything clicked. The bones, the guts and other miscellaneous parts of animals hanging on the dead tree branches. And that's when I looked up and a grotesque, elongated hand came from around the tree. We bolted down the hill. I didn't care about our stuff. They could be replaced. We faced in and out of running and jogging. We had our lights and we were looking for a landmark, anything, something. That's when I remember that before we came to the trail, there was a big sign with the words, Washita National Forest. I made that a point in my mind and looked around for it with my eyes. My lungs were burning. My legs were in pain, but I kept running. I would glance back and check on Drew and how close he is behind me. I turned off my flashlight and so did Drew. We laid up against a tree, still as possible. I could see the breath of Drew, frozen in the moonlight. My eyes finally adjusted to the dark and I looked over at Drew and turned on my light. An arm long and bony, covered in blood. It sank its nails into the shoulder of Drew. Immediately, blood started spewing out. He started screaming in pain, and he was lifted up, screaming louder and more painfully. He was slammed on the ground. He looked up at me, his eyes filled with tears. He was dragged through the forest, screaming, taking shots with his shotgun. With every shot, I could see his silhouette moving further and further into the woods. I ran. I just kept running. And that's when I tripped over something, and I started falling down the rest of the hill. I slammed up against a tree. I stopped and my back was in pain. I realized it was quiet again. There were no crickets. Nothing. Just silence. My eyes already adjusted to the darkness. I could see through the woods. In the distance, the moonlight was shining through the trees. I lay still as possible. And then I heard some shuffling, and I saw that thing moving through the woods. It was strange, jagged, and tense. I can't even describe it. It just felt wrong. 
It was tall and thin. Its bones were rubbing up against its skin. It seemed very malnourished. It shifted back and forth as if it was looking for something. When it turned its face, the grace of the moonlight revealed its features. It was disturbing. It had an elongated chin and small eyes, dark folds of skin around them. The skin was darkish gray. Its mouth was large. It spread all the way across its face. It had its teeth jagged and broken. Its mouth and nose was covered in blood and also in chunks of meat. The blood trailed down and covered its torso. I was about 10 yards away from it and it crawled on all fours. It started to come towards me. Closer and closer, I could smell it. It smelled like roadkill. That's when I threw up in my mouth and held my breath. My hope at this point was that my death would come quickly. I still had some hope, hope that I would make it out alive. But suddenly, this thing started speaking. James, James, James. In the most ungodly voice I ever fucking heard. The part that made my hope disappear was when it started saying my name in my friend's voice. James, James, James. It wasn't just like his. It had two tones, one deep and the other, my friend's voice. It kept saying this and it crawled the way through the woods, back up the hill. I stayed there for I don't know how long. I cried silently and for some reason I started moving my hand around and I found something. It was cold and rectangular. I looked closer. It was the lighter that belonged to Drew and my flashlight had broken on my fall. I stood up slowly and grabbed my bag. I turned and slung it into the woods and ran towards the parking lot. It started screaming my name, but this time it sounded demonic. This time it was no longer my friend's voice. I kept running and I didn't recognize anything. I flicked the lighter of Drew and scanned the area. My hand ended up hitting something. It was a sign and with the lighter I read National Forest. I looked back and heard that same screech and I ran through the tree line. At a distance I saw my truck. I ran as much as I could and when I got there I flung the door open and jumped into my truck and started it. I flipped my gears, pulled out, and hit the gas flying out of that parking lot. As I drove, I looked back. And God, I wish I hadn't looked back. It had broken the tree line, and it noticed me driving away. It stopped in the light of the parking lot, now shown in detail. It fucking stood tall. It was at least 9 or 10 feet tall. And its face, I'll never get that picture out of my head. It looked angry and its eyes were full of hate and what I assumed at the moment hungry I put the pedal to the floor I tore off the side road and onto the highway I looked at myself my jacket was torn and ripped I was covered in dirt and had cuts and scrapes everywhere I pulled up to the police station and according to what information I had gotten it took a while for the cops to stop me from screaming about that it had killed Drew a bunch of men got together the next day and rounded up a search party with the sheriff leading the search. I ended up refusing to go. They scaled through the mountain and searched for my friend. It was nighttime when they found him. He was barely recognizable, they said. They found him under a log. His eyes had been ripped out. His tongue was forcefully pulled out. His arms and legs had been mauled. He had been gutted and his genitals had been cut off and his face they told me his face was scratched and seemed to have been chewed down to the bones and his neck had been broken in so many places I can't even express through here how terrible I feel for running and not trying to help him I still remember his tears streaming down his face before he was dragged away from me on paper it was reported as a bear attack after the incident my grandfather came and talked to me. He said, I'm so sorry about what happened to your friend. All the people in my town know the existence of that theme. I heard countless stories of local hunters. 
that have came across it. It's been about eight years. I'm 25 now. There's not a day that passes that I don't think of my friend. He was my best friend. I'll leave you with this warning. If you ever go camping, be careful and keep yourself armed. I never want something like this to happen to anyone. I don't even wish that experience on my worst enemy. However, I still go hunting to this day. But I warn you, never go into the woods in Arkansas. During winter, you may just find something out there that you don't want to find. And it may just be a mental thing. But sometimes at night, when it's really quiet, I can hear my friend calling my name. For the past 18 years, not including three years in college, I lived in a remote part of the Appalachians. Phone service is virtually non-existent at my house, and using the internet requires a 30-minute trip to the local library. Even though the area is isolated, I always consider it a peaceful and safe place to call home. With so few people around, there's nobody to commit crimes in the first place. Home is a vast expanse of rolling greenery, which in the fall becomes a wild display of reds, oranges, and yellows, like the embers of a slowly dying campfire. I never could have comprehended the horror that this breathtaking landscape could conceal until last night. As a senior pre-med student, I got a busy schedule, endless hours of labs and class, followed by nerve-wracking evenings spent trying to be accepted somewhere. When I saw an opening in my calendar, I felt compelled to return to the primal beauty where I grew up. Thankfully, my lovely girlfriend of two years also had an open weekend, so I felt a surge of excitement at the prospect of sharing my home with her. We took off to the mountains late Friday afternoon with our windows down, bathing ourselves in the crisp fall air. After about an hour of driving, the mountain I call home came into view. I shifted my car into four-wheel drive and we began the long crawl up the rocky trail that can be loosely termed my driveway, you can say. We gradually went through the depths of the forest until my house came into view. More specifically, my guest house, located about a quarter mile from my main home. The guest house is the home that we keep clean for company. A stark comparison to our more cluttery main home. A gentle rain fell as we brought our bags inside. My parents greeted us and we enjoyed a brief home cooked dinner with plenty of small talk and laughing. Around midnight, my parents let us be and we made ourselves cozy. A city girl her whole life, my girlfriend is fascinated by the outdoors and animals. More specifically, she loves listening to the mournful noises of coyotes. Naturally being a mountain man, I long ago mastered the art of screeching realistic noises that coyotes make and even barks. On most nights, I can easily draw some lonely pack of coyotes to respond back. We huddle around my bedroom window and I let out a few of them. My girlfriend looked at me as I try making the same loud, ridiculous noises that coyotes make and then we waited for a response. Nothing. I tried again, and nothing but the echo of my own voice responded. Maybe it's too cold, I thought. Or a cold rainy night, the coyotes are most likely huddle inside their cave, trying to sleep away the rough weather. But then suddenly, something answered. Coyotes can make strange sounds. But this was different. A shriek echoed up the hollows, almost human sounding, but too high pitch and piercing in tone to be produced by a human. I gasped. My girlfriend hopped up in fright. What was that? She then asked in a nervous voice. Maybe it was a bobcat. I howled again and waited. Again. The shriek split the cold, foggy air of the forest. 
though this time it was much closer. I reached for my flashlight and shone a beam of light through the depths of the mist-filled air. I swung the beam around searching and just at the edge of the beam I saw something unimaginable. As a keen student of biology I have some knowledge of animals and this was something different. It was standing on two legs covered in patchy hair and its feet was that of a deer. Its upper body was almost humanoid again covered in patchy hair. The skin of its stomach clung tightly to its exposed ribs. On top of this anorexic looking frame was a head that looked once human and at once animal with branches of sharp antlers coming out from the back of its head. This creature started walking with its bony legs and it seemed to be making its way to the front porch. Go the fuck upstairs Anna, I told my girlfriend. Anna sprinted out of the room and went up the stairs while I grabbed my trusty shotgun which was attached to the porch and shined my light through the window on the door. My beam was met with eyes that would scare the soul from your body. The eyes were empty and pale but they were alive with a sort of ancient energy and they gazed straight through my terrified adrenaline soaked brain. The walls of the house reverberated with a deafening explosion as I began unloading my shotgun on the door and my flashlight fell to the floor. It almost seemed pointless to be shooting at those eyes but they stared at me with such a demonic and otherworldly aspect that I could not begin to understand their motives. Screams punctuated the roar of my 12 gauge thunder. Screams from both the creature and my partner hiding upstairs. The eyes vanished Silence then came, as the roar of the shotgun had moments before, and I called my parents from the home phone. Hey, some night you had, right? My dad chuckled in the morning. Yeah, never seen a bear that close to the house. I squeaked out. Yeah, I'm kind of pissed about the door, but a bear like that can't be left alone. Poor Anna. Too scared to stay the rest of the weekend. My dad said. So we're back at school and I have no idea what to do. My parents would think I was crazy if I told them the truth behind this weekend. But I can't leave them there with that thing. Something that paranormal doesn't seem as though it would die at the volley of a shotgun. Maybe posting this on here will actually help me clear my mind. And figure out how to deal with this. What do you all think? Let me know. I work as a park ranger in a state-run park in Appalachia. It's a little over 5,000 acres with a large lake on the property, which actually draws in many people in boats. There are many hiking, walking, horseback trails along the several campground areas, two old cemeteries, and also an old building that belonged to a church that held its last service in 1943. My colleagues and I are a small team of five along with our head warden. I am one of the full-time rangers, so I'm actually here all the time. And I can confidently say I know the trails and sections like the back of my hand. I've been doing this for just over seven years, which doesn't seem too long. But for the size of the park, I have confidence in my ability to do my job. However, some things do get strange and horrifying and tragic quite often around here. Around when I first started my career with the park I had my first encounter with something strange. We don't have gates to keep people out nor do we charge admission so we stay open pretty late. Usually open till 10 p.m. since there are often people camping anyways. We just try to keep the average park goers away after late. If the weather is nice I will take my horse to patrol instead of my PV, personal vehicle. I can sneak up on people better that way. You'll be surprised how many people get freaked out over someone walking up to them on horseback after dark. Always gives me a chuckle when it's some tough kid trying to impress a girl. He turns and sees a huge dark figure and yells, oh shit, or something of that sort. 
Anyways, this night was amazing, so I saddled up on Brave and did my rounds. The areas with the most issues after hours are trespassers who are usually in the cemeteries and the old church, which is on the grounds of the larger cemetery. The other cemetery is a bit smaller and much older and sits way out in the forest. People gravitate to the one with the church because while it's close to the road, it's large enough to hide in if you hear a personal vehicle coming. Plus, it's on a real hill and surrounded by thick woods. The cemetery is just a short ways from our station, so the ride was only a few minutes. I came up over a hill in the road and saw a vehicle, a car, plastered with band stickers, parked in the small lot in front of the church. I knew then that there was most likely a group of teens in the cemetery trying to scare the crap out of each other. Leaving Brave hitched on the fence by the car, I scanned the cemetery and didn't see anyone. However, it's pitch black and there are no lights there. Electricity is not running anywhere near the place. I radioed to my boss at the station that I had people in the cemetery of the church and would let him know when they were on their way. He confirmed. I silently made my way through the tombstones, hoping to spot the group before I actually had to start yelling out over the graves. Plus, part of me is a bit of a bully, and I love to scare the shit out of people in the middle of the night by sneaking up and confronting them when they least expect it. It didn't take me long before I spotted some faint lights over by the edge of the cemetery. It was a group of five girls. I started walking towards them and they must have heard me because they all turned in my direction and two of them screamed. I turned on my flashlight and shined it on them. Alright girls, fun's over. You know you can't be in here this late. However, they seemed kind of relieved to find that I was just a person. When I finally reached them, I noticed that they were all silent. It felt creepy and awkward. But then again, we're all standing in a dark cemetery. Let's move. Come on. I pressed. They slowly started walking towards the parking lot ahead of me. As we walked, I realized that something seemed off. The night was calm and there was no wind. It finally dawned on me that there was no sound whatsoever. No late night owls, no crickets, frogs, or anything else. Nothing. Which is crazy around here. The frogs will normally drive you mad with their calls at night. I think we all jumped when there was a loud pop sound from the forest to the left of us. The girls froze and they all got around me. Another pop. It sounded to me like large limbs were being snapped off trees like twigs. I shined my light over the tree line and one of the girls said, Stop. I dropped the beam towards my feet. One of them shoved a point and shoot camera into my hand with an image on the little screen. I was confused as I tried to process what I was seeing. They had taken a shot of the forest with the flash on. The image was still nearly black, but I could see the trunks up in the canopies. Then, a shiver shook through me. There were at least a dozen large sets of big red glowing eyes reflecting from the flash of the camera. I'm talking basketball sized eyes, all roughly the same height in the trees. I was trying to process this in my head, but then another, louder, wooden pop shattered the air and the six of us were bolting for the parking lot. Brave was visibly freaking out ripping and pulling at the reins I tied to the fence. The girls jumped in their car. I could still hear the loud popping noise getting closer. It was definitely wood. Like the sound a tree makes when it falls, creating a loud, splintering crack. I tried to think of what it could be. I looked down at the camera I had in my hands. The photo was still on the screen. Maybe there were just unusually large owls. Maybe one tree had fallen on another and caused some limbs to snap. At this point in my time at the park, I was still pretty good at convincing myself to remain realistic. I turned back towards the woods, held the camera up, and snapped another picture. The large, red eyes were now all down by our end of the forest, 
near the parking lot, still as high up as the canopies and staring in our direction. I found it strange how calm I was as I walked over to the car the girls were in. I handed the camera to the driver who had rolled her window down. I untied Brave and scooted the hell out of there. I glanced behind me to make sure the girls were leaving. They were on our heels. I was hoping they would come to the station to file a report with me. But when I noticed them haul ass out the park entrance, I couldn't exactly blame them. When I tried talking to my boss about it, he assured me it was just some dead tree snapping to gravity, and the eyes were most likely just owls. It was pretty easy to convince me, since I was already thinking that. I still make sure I never go back into that cemetery at night. If there are people in there, I have made it a point to yell out to get their attention and actually let them come to me. Yeah, I know, it's a coward move, but I can't shake the feeling that those glowing eyes would still be there if you flash the light over the dark forest. Jacob cursed as he pushed through the thick underbrush, trying to make his way to the tree stand he had built earlier in the summer. He was for sure that this location would give him a good sight to the neighboring field, in which he frequently saw large herds of deer. This was going to be his year, and he was sure of it. This is the year that I bring home my trophy buck, he told himself, as he recalled the events of the day so far. He had awakened at 4.30 a.m. He began to get ready for the long day in the woods on the backside of his farm. His first order of business had been to locate and rescue his gloves and camouflage hunting gear from whatever undisclosed area of his home that his wife had hidden them. He was going to need them this morning to protect him from the bitter cold November morning. How could it be this cold? This early in the year, he wondered as he started to work on his second task of the day, which was to make a breakfast that would stick to his ribs long into the day. But he finally settled on toast, country ham, and scrambled eggs. He topped it all off with a large cup of coffee that had left a bitter aftertaste in his mouth. In fact, he could still taste it. After this, he packed himself a cheese sandwich for lunch. He grabbed his Remington hunting rifle, some coffee, and headed out the door. He loaded his gear into his truck and pulled out of the driveway and turned right into the one-lane blacktop road that led to the backside of his property. After about two and a quarter miles, he turned right again. He had to travel about half a mile down that pitiful rut-filled excuse for a road when he came to his desired location. He then got out of his truck and loaded his gun and walked off into the woods. 10 minutes out of the truck and he was already cold and it was made worse by the cloudy overcast day and the wind that was blowing through the trees making all the leaves rattle like dry bones. Oh well, he thought, it's gonna be a good day anyway, especially if I bring home a big one Jacob took about 10 more steps when an uneasy feeling began to creep over him. He felt as though someone had stepped over his grave. He got the distinct feeling that he was being watched. But by whom? This was, after all, his property. And it was posted. No one had permission to be on his land. He had to be alone. But if he was alone... Why couldn't he shake this eerie feeling that was scratching at the base of his skull? Something was off today. There was a silence in the forest. No birds, no insects, only the sound of the wind in the trees. Convincing himself that it was nothing more than a case of nerves, he continued to press on until he came to a clearing, not too far from his tree stand. Stepping into the clearing, Jacob saw the remains of what appeared to be a large deer. But he wasn't quite able to make out what he was seeing from this distance. 
because the sun wasn't completely up yet and the forest was still covered in shadows. Jacob then walked closer to get a better look and found that he had been correct. It was a deer. A large eight point buck in fact. Looking at the remains, he felt a sense of dread come over him and icy fingers dance along his spine. Something about this kill just didn't seem right. The throat was completely torn out and the stomach was ripped open. Plus, also several of the internal organs were missing. This definitely wasn't a coyote kill and no hunter would have done this. They would have taken the head to have it mounted. What could have done this, he wondered. A fear like nothing he had ever experienced before began to wash over him in waves. What is going on, he thought. At nearly 225 pounds and well over 6 foot, he wasn't one to give in to fear, but now he couldn't seem to calm down, and his heart was beating like a trip hammer. That feeling that he was being watched was getting stronger by the minute and he couldn't shake the feeling that he was moments away from a bad situation. He slowly started to back away from the mangled body and head back to his truck and back to safety. No more than six steps into his journey, his blood turned to ice in his veins as a deep guttural scream shattered the eerie silence and what was left of his courage. He had grown up on the farm all of his life and had been an experienced hunter since he was a child. He was familiar with every animal in the part of the state. Fear now gave way to stark terror as he chambered around into his Remington rifle and turned around only to find there was nothing behind him. His mind raced with confusion and he was confronted with a million thoughts at once. What should I do? What could it be? Should I run? Am I going to die? His survival sense kicking into overdrive. Jacob decided to continue on his previously contrived plan, which was to get to the truck and get out of there. Slowly and cautiously, he made his way toward the perceived salvation of his vehicle, silently praying every step of the way. With 300 yards separating him from his only avenue of escape, Jacob began to hear heavy footfalls off to his left. He could hear the crunching of withered leaves, sticks, and the breeze that littered the forest floor. Summoning every ounce of courage that remained within him, he forced himself to look in the direction of the noise. And that is when he saw the dark silhouette that followed him through the forest. Quickening his pace, he redoubled his efforts to reach the truck and get to a phone and call the sheriff, the game warden, or anyone that would listen. He couldn't tell what it was that was stalking him, but he could clearly see that it towered more than seven feet and was incredibly massive. Jacob couldn't help but think that he was about to become a national statistic, a person who left home under normal circumstances and just disappear without a trace. How many people, he wondered, go into the woods and just vanish, and the authorities just assume that they have become lost, injured, or been the victims of animal attacks, with their bodies never recovered. Please God, don't let that happen to me, he told himself, as he drew closer and closer to his truck. 75 yards became 50, and 50 became 30 and 30 became 10 and like a miracle he was back and opening his door throwing his rifle inside he pulled himself up into the cab and started the engine and hit the gas but the truck went nowhere he had parked in a puddle of mud and now the tires simply spun in place not now he thought I can't be stuck allowing himself a moment to think Jacob remember this truck is a four-wheel drive. There is no way I can be stuck and was ready to punch the gas and leave this nightmare behind. Unfortunately for Jacob, some nightmares 
are not so easily left behind. And there is nothing worse than a nightmare you can't wake up from. And Jacob was about to learn that the hard way. Hearing something to his right, he turned and immediately wished that he had not. It took him maybe half a second to turn his head, but he would have given anything in the world to have that half second back because it was the last moment that his world would ever see normal again. In that split second, his world changed. It was no longer a place where the world was light and safe, where he was just a husband and a dad and a guy that liked to go hunting and watch football on the weekends. That reality had evaporated away and all that was left was a world where monsters existed and things really do go bump in the night. And now an ambassador from that nightmare realm was standing just outside his passenger door. A visible reminder that his world had been turned upside down. Jacob screamed as he stared transfixed on this escapee from a horror movie. In his most terrifying fevered dream he couldn't have imagined that such a thing could exist. It was hideously ugly, easily standing eight feet tall with a thick muscular body. There was just something about that face that was just wrong. Almost like a mixture of a man and an animal experiment that had gone horribly wrong. It was the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. It was completely covered with thick shaggy black hair that was matted in areas with God only knows what. And it walked on two legs, not on four legs like you would expect from some kind of animal. What was this thing that had shattered his perception of reality? Was it a demon? Was it a werewolf? It can't be, he thought. Those things don't exist. But whatever it was, it was staring at him, and it didn't look happy. The menacing juggernaut threw its enormous head back and let out a blood-curling scream that resonated throughout the surrounding area and seemed to vibrate him to his very core. Shocked back into action, Jacob threw his truck into gear and took off as though he was being chased by the very hounds of hell. Jacob, with his mind racing, wondered what he was going to do. How will I ever feel safe on this farm again, he thought. Are my wife and children in danger? What and where did this thing come from? And will anyone believe me? The whirlwind of thoughts that swirled through Jacob's mind came to an immediate stop as he slammed on his brakes and nearly slid off the road. In a state of disbelief, Jacob sat staring at the large hackberry tree that laid across the dirt road and blocked his path, preventing him from reaching the black top and guarantee safety. How is this even possible, he thought. I just came down this road not even 30 minutes ago, and this path was clear. It was painfully obvious to Jacob that he had to get that tree move if he was going to make it back home. Since he didn't have a chain to pull the tree out of the road, nor did he have a saw with which he could cut up the unexpected barricade, he was left with a few options, one of which was walking, which he discounted immediately. The most logical course of action that he could come up with was to call for help. His best friend Kenny Patterson owned the farm just over from his. If he were home, he could bring a saw and cut the tree up for him. Jacob, with his nerves still frazzled and frayed, reached into his glove box and pulled out his cell phone and dialed Kenny's number. The phone rang six times and Jacob was about to give up when Kenny answered the phone and said, Hey ugly, what do you want this early in the morning? As quickly as he could, he told the recent events to Kenny and said, Please, hurry, I'm not kidding, there is something out here. Kenny, hearing the shakiness in his friend's voice, assured him that he would be there in a matter of minutes. Jacob thanked him and hanged up the phone, and braced himself for what he was sure would be the longest few minutes of his life. Sitting motionless inside of his truck, every sound made his imagination run wild 
with fear. Even though little more than three minutes had passed since he had spoken to Kenny, it felt as if hours had passed. The clock seemed to be an eternity. Jacob frequently checked in all directions for any sign to see if this nightmarish monstrosity had pursued them. In every shadow that the forest and on this cloudy day produced, he thought he saw the shape of the black beast that had followed him out of the woods, and he was afraid that he would lose himself long before Kenny arrived to clear the tree out of his path. After what seemed like a lifetime, Jacob heard the sound of Kenny's old truck sputtering up the road, and in just moments, he was able to see the old red Chevy as it made its way closer to him. Jacob's spirits lifted when he saw his old friend, and a sense of relief washed over him as he realized that he was no longer alone. Stepping out of his truck, Jacob said, Man, what took you so long? I told you to hurry. Kenny, with a surprised look on his face, what are you talking about? You only called me 11 minutes ago. I think I made pretty good time. Jacob could hardly believe that only 11 minutes had passed. It had seemed so much longer. After apologizing to his friend and telling him exactly how happy he was to see him, both men walked over to the fallen tree and made a discovery that startled them both. The tree had not broken. It had not been cut. It had been pushed over and completely uprooted. All around the tree were large bipedal footprints that had a somewhat human appearance to them. But if they were human, the owner would require a size 28 shoe. Jacob and Kenny looked at each other and then without a word went to work on the tree. Kenny took a chainsaw from the bed of his truck and began to cut up the fallen blockade. Meanwhile, Jacob pulled the logs and debris from the road. Mission accomplished. Kenny put away his saw, and he and Jacob were about to get in their vehicles and leave. But before they could even open their doors, an ear-splitting scream erupted from the woods behind them. Jacob walked over to Kenny and whispered, That's what I was telling you about. I don't know what that thing is, man, but it looks like some kind of monster. And I think we need to get out of here, now. Kenny looked as though the blood had drained completely out of his face, became very pale, as he said to Jacob. Jacob, man, I never mentioned this to anyone before now, but over the last few months, that thing has been killing off a few of my cows. Their throats are usually torn out, and the bodies are mangled and broken. I didn't want anyone to accuse me of being crazy and making stuff up, so I never said anything about it. But that's the reason I rushed over here when you called. I actually heard that sound a few times off in the distance at night, but never this close. So I think you are right, old buddy. It's time to go. Cautiously and with a sense of urgency, Jacob and Kenny climbed into their vehicles and made their way back into the blacktop. Both vehicles then began the two and a half mile trek that led back to Jacob's house so they could decide what course of action should be taken. Jacob could feel the temperature drop as snow began to gently fall. He then reached over and turned his wipers on as snow began to pelt the windshield harder. As he passed his neighbor, William Springer's farm, he noticed a herd of deer grazing in the field that bordered his own property. Having put a distance between himself and the nightmare he had just encountered, Jacob felt a renewed sense of security as his fatigued nerves began to calm down. Not willing to let this opportunity pass him by, Jacob turned on his hazard lights and pulled to the shoulder of the road and signaled Kenny to do the same. Kenny knew what Jacob was thinking as he pulled in behind him and turned his ignition off. Getting out of his truck, Kenny said, What are you doing, man? We need to get out of here now. Jacob said, I know, and we will, in just a minute, man. I just can't turn this down. I have to take the shot. That's a six-point buck standing there. It's not the trophy that I wanted, but at least I won't end up going home empty-handed. And after what happened this morning, I think I deserve a little something good. All right, just take the shot. 
so we can go. I still don't feel right about this, Kenny said. Jacob steadied his rifle across the hood of his truck. He zeroed in on the buck and was getting ready to fire. That's when he heard Kenny make a gasping noise and whisper. Oh my god, what is it man? What's wrong with you? Raise your scope three inches, he said. Raising the scope, Jacob immediately saw what had been the cause of Kenny's alarm. Standing just outside a tree line in the edge of the field was the creature that they had left behind. Not even five minutes. Was this thing following them? Was it after the deer? What was it doing? Jacob watched the creature through his scope for a full 30 seconds before it even moved. And when it did, it ignored him and the deer and started to walk towards William's barn that was just about 500 yards from where the woodland demon had been standing. Jacob called out to Kenny and said, Kenny, call William and tell him that there is something trying to get into his barn. I know he has livestock in there, and if that thing gets in it, it will kill all of them. Attempting to get rid of this monster, werewolf, wendigo, or whatever it was, Jacob fired a shot, but missed. The creature turned towards them and glared at them through red, hate-filled eyes, and then began to run towards them at full steam. Kenny, who was still on the phone with William, screamed at Jacob to get in his truck and go. Jacob did as he was told, and Kenny followed right behind him. Starting their trucks, Jacob and Kenny both raced to Jacob's house as though they were driving on the NASCAR circuit. Arriving at home, Jacob, gun in hand, ran inside to get a phone book so that they could call the game warden and the police and get some kind of animal control out there to get rid of this thing. Jacob had just stepped out of his front porch when they heard gunfire coming from over at William's place. Dropping the phone book and running back inside, Jacob grabbed his 12 gauge shotgun and some shells and handed them to Kenny who took little time in loading it. Jacob and Kenny now locked and loaded, walked together to their truck and got ready to mount up a rescue for their neighbor William. Simultaneously, both of them stopped in their tracks as a familiar but uneasy feeling crept over them and Jacob's two German shepherds began to whimper and ran under the front porch to hide. Kenny, whose throat had gone dry as a bone, whispered to Jacob and said, I have a really bad feeling about this. No sooner had the words escaped his lips they heard a scream erupt from the forest, off to the right, and the creature exploded from the trees in front of them. Until now, neither man had been able to fully appreciate the colossal size and scope of the beast, but standing less than 30 feet away from them, they were almost overcome by the sheer magnitude of it. Jacob had seen it up close earlier from his truck while sitting down, and had guessed the height at maybe 8 feet, but now, standing there, Looking up, he could tell that this fellow was eight and a half or nine feet tall and would tip the scale at 800 to 1,000 pounds. It had inhuman long arms that were easily seen beneath its long shabby black hair, which covered it from head to toe. The chest was larger than a 55-gallon drum, and there was little doubt that it could have pulled the arms off an ape, and now it stood there, staring at them. Jacob and Kenny both opened fire without hesitation. The creature screamed with rage as the bullets tore into its massive body, knocking it to the ground, but not killing or seriously injuring it. Jacob and Kenny watched speechless as it crawled into the tree line, struggled to its feet, and limped away. Jacob ran back to the porch and grabbed the phone book and called the local game warden. Nearly two hours later, Gene, the local warden, showed up to take their statements and told him that he had been called out to answer numerous such reports in the area but he wasn't sure what to make of all these reports guys he said i don't know what to tell you there is no animal in this area or any area for that matter that fits your description i'm not saying i don't believe you i just don't know what it is jacob whose face was red and with anger said come here Here's the blood from where we shot it, and here are the footprints. A look of complete confusion washed over Jean's face, 
and he asked if they would care to go with him as he tried to track it. Jacob and Kenny agreed, but they said they weren't going without a gun. Gene stated that he planned to take his gun as well. All three men loaded their guns and set out following the tracks and droplets of blood that had fallen on the leaves. They followed the trail for about a mile until arriving at a creek that was located deep in Jacob's woods where the tracks that they were following were joined by others just like them. Some were smaller, but at least one set was larger. Deciding that the safest course of action would be to return home, they all went back to Jacob's. None of them gave up the idea of staying out in the woods longer since there was now apparently more than one creature. And the cloudy overcast day made the forest seem even darker than it would normally be this time of day. Back at Jacob's, Gene informed them that there was nothing left that he could do but file it under an unknown animal sighting, which made both Kenny and Jacob anything but happy. Jacob and Kenny spent the next couple of days trying to warn their neighbors to use caution when they were out in the forest. Most of their friends just laughed at them and said they had most likely just seen a bear or something. No one believed them except William who had also seen it himself the same day they had. He had even taken a shot at it but missed. Jacob, William and Kenny knew what they had seen and they knew it was still out there and they didn't care who believed them and who didn't. Over the next few weeks, more and more neighbors began to take the story a little more seriously as family pets began to disappear and other pets were found mangled. Other farms in the area began to find their cows and other livestock torn open with their throats ripped out. Just a week after shooting the creature in his yard, Jacob's own German Shepherd was found dead with its throat torn out and it was hanging across a limb in a tree in his front yard. It almost seemed like a revenge killing. A few days later, one of William's new animals died the same way. Some people in the area still don't believe. They think the whole story was made up. But Jacob and Kenny know that there is still something out there in the forest. They still occasionally find tracks or a slaughtered cow or goat. They still hear the blood curling screams off into the woods at night. They know that there is still something out there. Watching and waiting. Biding its time. Something cold and cunning and cruel, something not human, with a taste for blood and revenge. This is one of the scariest experiences that has ever happened to me. Even simply by writing this, it brings back so many nightmares and it reminds me as to why I will never go camping again. I had been attending Camp Rock Water for about four years now. I used to love camping, being able to see some new faces, getting to do fun and exciting activities. My favorite was the river rope swing. I never wanted to leave that swing once I got on. I was just so excited to go back, mainly because it would be my last year I went. And then summer finally came, and it was finally time to go camping. When I got to camp after a four hour car ride, I was so excited. I was remembering all my old favorite places. First things first, my mom had to take me to the lodge to get signed up. When we got into the lodge, there were a lot of people there. We waited in line until it was our turn to sign up before we were handed any papers. The lady at the table told us that there had recently been some weird things going on a few miles down through the woods from us. I just brushed it off and ignored it. I think I was just too excited to finally be able to go to camp again. My mom helped me lug my suitcase to the cabin. When we got there, I was so happy to see some old friends from last year. Kyle was one of my longtime camp friends. He was sitting in the corner making his bed. Jacob, another one of my really good friends, was on the floor taking stuff out of his bag. 
and who could forget about Brad? He was putting stuff in the closet, like baseball bats and golf clubs. As for the other two kids, I had no idea who they were, but they both seemed to like me. It turns out they were brothers. Their names were Brandon and Nathan, and it being their first year here, they were kind of nervous. We all got settled in, and after our parents left, we sat down and started talking about past adventures in camp. It wasn't for another hour that our cabin leader arrived. When he got in, he kind of looked at us all with a gloomy face. He turned to us and said, Hey guys, I'm your cabin leader for the next two weeks. Now, before we do anything, I have to tell you that some things have changed and we will have to be more cautious due to the weird things that have been happening. We all were a little uneasy, but we wouldn't let that stop us from having the best summer ever. The day continued on as normal. We introduced ourselves, played some cards in our cabin, went outside, and played basketball. Went to the mess hall to eat, and came back to the cabin to sleep. It was kind of strange that there were only six cabins full of people, when there was always around 30. So the next day we woke up, it was raining hard. The sounds of the rain smacking the metal roofs of the cabins echo off to the distance. The camp leader was nowhere to be found. So we kind of sat around the middle of the cabin, just waiting for our cabin leader to get back. We then started talking about some ghost stories that happened around the camp. Some of them seemed completely stupid, but others were kind of scary. And just to let you all know, Outside of our cabin, there were about 400 acres of woods. In those woods, there were some obstacle courses, the chapel, and the river. There was one more thing in the woods that nobody really knew about, because it was so far off. It was the original Camp Rock water cabins. There were only a few of the older cabin leaders that knew about it and how to get to them. They say that back in the early 1900s, when the camp was first established, two kids got into a fight in their cabins and one kid killed the other in his sleep. He had apparently taken a heavy rock and dropped it on the other boy's head. Legend has it that the presence of the boy who was killed is seen walking around the old campground and chapel. They say that the boy can sometimes be seen crying at the back of the chapel Someone even said they went to the cabins and saw his head peeking out from one of the windows. At this point, everyone in our cabin was really scared. I swear, Brad was going to have a panic attack. That's when our camp leader came rushing in through our cabin door. He told us that we needed to pack our things and go to the lodge. We would have to call our parents in the morning to tell them to take us home. We walked all the way from our cabin to the lodge in the rain completely wet. When we got there, only four other cabins had been there. As I was sitting next to the fireplace with my cabin mates, we overheard people talking about what was going on. Someone had said that all of cabin six had gone missing after returning from the chapel. The conversations after that got really boring that we ended up falling asleep in the lodge. Later that night, I woke all of my friends. I wanted to go and check out what happened in the woods. Call me stupid all you want. But mind you, I was also younger. Though at first all of my friends didn't want to go, they still agreed to tag along with me. We grabbed a few flashlights and snuck past the cabin leaders that were sleeping near the exit. When we got outside, it was still raining. But now, it was also pitch black outside. It still didn't stop us from heading over to the woods. When our group finally got to the mouth of the woods, Brad and Jake just couldn't do it. They walked back to the lodge through the shortcut in the gardens. All that were left were Kyle, Brandon, Nathan, and I. We walked slowly through the path that leads to the chapel. Every now and then, we would trip over some uprooted trees, but we still kept going. We could see the chapel ahead of us, but we knew there was something wrong. It was very quiet. The rain had stopped too, and there was no wind. 
nor any kind of animal in sight. As we walked up to the chapel, Brandon, who was carrying one of the flashlights, just started screaming. He then ran as fast as he could back towards camp and dropped his flashlight. The light was shining through the chapel, and I kid you not, through one of the windows, we saw the face of a child crying. That's when we all screamed and started to run towards the camp as well. Out of fear, we lost all sense of direction and had no idea where any of us were. As we came up to the ravine that led down to the river, that's where we saw in the pitch darkness a silhouette of a small black figure that was blocking our way. Our only way out was taking the ravine. Nathan, Kyle, and I began going down the side of the ravine and we noticed another figure. That's when I shot my flashlight down a ways and there was Brandon just lying dead with his head smashed in. Blood everywhere. To be honest though, it seemed like he had tripped maybe on an uprooted tree and fell down the side of the ravine but we had to just keep running so we left him there. We were halfway down the ravine when we could feel the sweat falling into our eyes like ocean water. And there it was again, the figure of a little boy standing at the end of the ravine waiting for us to play with him. I told everyone just to keep running and that's when I looked behind us and Nathan had disappeared. He was no longer with us. I'm not sure if he took another way or ended up running a different path or back, but he was completely gone. Kyle and I kept running, and that's when I saw the old stairs coming up to our left that led back up to the back part of camp. When we got to the stairs and we were almost to the top, that's when we could hear a kid saying, we can play with the rocks. We didn't even stop to look back. We ran all the way to the lodge. When we got there, all of the cabin leaders had been away. Two other cabins had left to go investigate what was going on in those woods. They both went missing. And then Kyle finally spoke up. Even though he hadn't said anything all night, he did say, I saw him. The boy just wanted to play with us. And that was it. The next morning, our parents picked all of us up, and we never went back again. Years have passed since that encounter. Kyle was booked into a mental hospital. They said for some serious mental issues that he had going on. Jake and Brad were never found, and nobody ever mentioned anything about them after that day. As for the other three cabins of kids, nobody ever found out what happened or where they went. Maybe nobody cares. But I will tell you this though, after this experience, I have never, nor will I ever, go camping again. I try to live my life without too many regrets. I had highs and lows like everyone else in life, sure, but I do what I can to not worry too much about what could have happened if I made a different choice, if I maybe hadn't taken the road less traveled. Everyone makes the best decisions they can with the information they have available to them at the time. Going through all the what ifs is crazy. Because the only way you would have made a different choice is if you had some other detail, which of course, you didn't. You can never be exactly sure what the sequence of events might have looked like if you gone right instead of left. And yet, there is one choice I made, one road that I took, that I just can't help but wonder how things might have turned out if I had only done something different. My job has me move around pretty often. I'm not going to get into what I do that has no bearing on the story. 
but a couple of years ago I was working in Philadelphia and living on the other side of the Delaware River in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I'm originally from northwestern Pennsylvania and this was the closest I had been to home since I moved out of college. So I took the chance to go see my parents whenever I could. I knew I would be moving again before long and my folks aren't getting any younger. So I try to find a weekend every month or so to make the seven hour trip to visit them. If I had been thinking about it when I was looking for places to rent, maybe I would have tried to live on the west side of Philadelphia instead of this side in Jersey to avoid the rush hour. But by the time I realized, the lease was signed and there wasn't much I could do. The drive to my hometown was pretty boring. I would take the Ben Franklin Bridge across the river, head up I-476 for an hour or so, then a long slog across basically the entire expanse of Pennsylvania on I-80 before another hour north of I-79. The only thing about the drive was how long it would take me to get through Philly because once I got on the 476 extension, I could predict my ETA within 5 or 10 minutes. My second summer in Jersey, I had taken two weeks off and planned on spending the second week back home. Things changed that first Wednesday though, because a big storm came by and knocked out power in a good part of the area where I was living. Dealing with 90 degree heat with no AC wasn't something I felt like spending the first half of my vacay doing. So after one uncomfortable sweaty night, I let my parents know that I was heading over a few days earlier. I should have left first thing in the morning but because I had a couple of things to take care of before heading out, by the time I finally got on the road that Thursday, it was past lunchtime and getting on mid-afternoon. For whatever reason, the traffic in Philly was heavy, and by the time I finally got through town, I was a good hour behind schedule. Still, based on my timeline, I figured I'd still be able to make it early enough to grab a dinner and beer with my dad and brother before cashing in for the night. There were two things I hadn't taken into consideration. One was the number of other folks that, apparently, had the same idea to get out of town that I did, and that the road construction must have sprung up in the time since my last trip home. The interstate highway system is a heck of a thing. Being able to sip along at 6570, or in some remote places like West Texas even faster than that, makes cross-country travel take a fraction of the hours it would otherwise. I can tell you the number of times my folks always talk about the days before the interstate when going to see friends outside of DC would take almost twice as long as it does now. What's truly remarkable to me though is that even though the entire system of highways was built start to finish in a mere 35 years, it sure seems like when parts of it go under construction they stay that way forever. Traffic was heavy but moving and I was making decent time until I saw the first orange warning signs letting me know that four lanes were reducing to three and then two and then one there were hundreds of cones stretched down the road as far as the eye could see and see I could as the cars in front of me reached the complete and total standstill it was one of the worst deadlocks I had ever been in Seriously, I think I moved about a mile in about an hour. After about three hours, my stomach started grumbling. With an exit just ahead and no end to the traffic jam in sight, I got off and found a diner to grab some dinner. Even if traffic picked up, I still had a solid five hours of driving ahead of me. So at that point, I knew for sure it was going to be pretty late that I was getting in. After finishing eating, I got back on the road. Things looked like they were picking up for a couple of miles. But then, I came up to the back end of a jam and was right back to waiting. We were moving a little bit better. I think averaging about five miles an hour at this point. But as the sun started edging towards the horizon, I pulled out my phone and started to see if Google could point me in any kind of workaround. It's a funny thing about human nature. Most of us don't like to sit still. Studies at airports show that people would rather walk further 
to baggage claim to get their luggage, even if the total time would have been less if they had a slightly longer wait at plain sight. Well, the power of the internet appeared to be in my favor. Even though I-80 still showed the dark red band for another 50 miles or so, there was a southbound country road coming up a few miles, and a northbound a couple after that. Both of these roads looked like they let me bypass the worst of the traffic. Since I spent the better part of the day sitting on the road, my patience was about worn out, and I opted to take the southbound road. Even though the app told me it would take about 30 minutes longer to get to my parents' house, I just wanted to get moving again, and reasoned that at this rate, it might take me more than a 35 minute difference to get to the northbound, and that is a choice that I will remember until the day I die. I made the turn off and felt my mood improve. The signs changed limiting my speed between 35 and 40 miles an hour. But even that seemed like flying compared to the log jam I spent the last several hours in. The drive was interesting. The road was starting to get a little twisty with plenty of changes as it curved up and around the hills of central Pennsylvania. It took me on a general southwest road but turned and doubled back on itself enough that for the first 30 minutes or so I had views of the stalled traffic on I-80. Pretty soon after that though, just about the time that the sun was just dipping down beneath a couple of hills in my rear view mirror, the road took a long curve and carried me down and away out of sight of the interstate. Now, something that a lot of people don't know is how big of a state Pennsylvania is. There are plenty of bigger ones, but Pennsylvania is really big and it's also remote, isolated. The translation of the name means Pence Woods. After all, the Blair Witch Project didn't have to embellish that aspect of the state. The fact that you could head into the woods and walk for dozens of miles in any way without seeing anything like another human being was pretty creepy. It's got a decent number of big cities, Pittsburgh and Philly. Both have enough of a population to support major sports teams, but away from those centers of development, there's a whole lot of nothing, and trees, and dark, and lonely roads. Such was the road I was traveling that night. Winding through the twists and turns of the Appalachian foothills, I moved around a lot. I mentioned I traveled through most of the states anyways. I sometimes used to wonder, when I would be driving along a patch of asphalt surrounded by only untamed wilderness. What it must have been like to build such a road. What was it like before man had intruded with our civilization and our machines? What used to live there? But I don't wonder anymore. Not ever since that night when I made a left instead of right. The road continued to twist back and forth, up and down. As I went deeper into the foothills, the trees grew thicker, branches from either side of the road reaching over and almost touching, forming a natural canopy 20 feet up that blocked out much of my view of the sky and the stars above. I drove with my high beams on because the idea of streetlights had never entered the minds of whoever built this road. The painted lines were old and not well cared for. I never been a good navigator. My parents used to say it was because when I was a kid, my nose was always pushed into a book during car rides. But I think it's because I'm just bad at it. So it was that. There was no way possible I could be lost as there were no other roads that I could have possibly turned onto and gotten off track. I also found myself more frequently checking my phone to ensure I was still on the right path, which is, how I almost ran into the other car. My mind was wondering, thinking about the fact that my signal bars had dropped and remained at zero for the last 20 minutes and what possible implications that would mean if I came across some kind of emergency. I raised my eyes back to the road after Google Maps confirmed for the 20th time that I was still on the right path. That's when my brain took a beat to process that I was approaching a vehicle 
stopped in the middle of the lane. I slammed my foot on the brake. I stopped in time, but not by much. With maybe five feet separating my hood from the other car's rear bumper, my heart was pounding in my chest as adrenaline coursed through my body. But my fear quickly gave way to anger. Seriously, what the hell was this guy doing? Not only was he stopped in the middle of the road, but all his lights were off. If I didn't have my high beams on, there was a good chance I wouldn't have seen him, even if I wasn't checking my phone. I could feel my heart beating in the vein on the side of my neck. I'm not somebody who struggles with road rage. And after a couple of quick seconds, I managed to get a hold of myself, not wanting to outright alarm anyone that might still be in the vehicle. I shifted into reverse and backed up about 20 feet, popping my emergency lights on. That's when I started noticing a few strange things about the stopped vehicle. More than just the fact that the lights were out. Of course, it was stopped in the middle of the road, but that wasn't unreasonable since there wasn't any shoulder that the driver could have moved onto. The strange thing though, was that the doors were open. Those on the driver's side, crossing over slightly onto the other lane. And even more, was that I saw that an item was dropped out onto the road by the rear driver's side door. Something that appeared to be a child stuffed animal. I considered my options and after a few seconds, decided that I would have to go against my better judgment to just keep on my merry way and head outside to get a better idea of what was going on. I said earlier my job doesn't have anything to do with the story, which is mostly true. But before you judge my choices, it bears mentioning that I spent some time in the military. An obligation to help people has been drilled into me over the years, and I've seen enough things while deployed to feel I could handle myself. And so I got out of my car but kept it running. I popped the trunk to grab the flashlight I keep there and left my headlights on so I could see what I was doing. I looked up and down the road, hoping to see signs of other cars approaching, but no luck. I called up to the other car as I cautiously started my approach, circling around to the left to the middle of the road so I'll be able to get a look inside before I got too close. Anyone, Anyone there? there? No answer. My headlights were helping, but there were enough shadows to still hide the car's interior. Shining my flashlight though, easily determined that no one was inside. I moved closer, stopping down by the rear door to pick up the falling object off the ground. It was a child's toy, just like I thought. A stuffed rabbit, with patches showing signs of frequent love. I frowned. If the folks traveling in the car had hitched the ride with somebody passing by, they would have taken the rabbit, or the kid would have been throwing a fit. I shut the rear door and moved up to the front. I put my hand on the hood and found it was still warm to the touch. That means it couldn't have been here too long. I slid into the driver's seat to try and figure out if there was some kind of mechanical issue that would have forced the car to stop and was startled to find a set of keys still dangling from the ignition. Pressing the brake, I turned the key and the engine started right up. Headlights and the interior light in the roof springing to life. Fuel, oil, temperature, battery, all the gauges looked good. Not even a check engine light. Strange. Very strange. Then I saw the purse in the passenger seat. I picked it up, a normal brown shoulder bag, and briefly rummaged around before finding a wallet inside. Everything appeared to be intact, about $40 in cash, a couple credit cards, gym membership, Sam's club card, the driver's license named the owner as Mary Walker, a pretty blonde that had just turned 30 the month before. There were a few pictures showing Mary in stage poses, sitting on a blanket under a tree, 
A huge, bearded lumberjack of a man hugged her from behind. A small ponytail girl with a goofy over-exaggerated smile on her lap. That's when I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. A shiver running down to the base of my spine. Something was very wrong with this situation. I put everything back in the purse and returned it to the seat. I turned off the car and got out, shutting the driver's door behind me. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and dialed 911, holding it over my head to try to get a connection with no luck. Cursing softly, I jammed the red end call button and moved around to the passenger side of the car. I played my flashlight around and noticed that some of the foliage at the edge of the road was bent and trampled like someone had walked through it. I didn't have enough woodcraft to be able to judge how long ago they might have passed. But even then, I couldn't imagine any scenario for why they would have gone wandering away. Shining my light into the woods, the beam only extended maybe 30 feet through the trees before being effectively swallowed by the greedy blackness. Looking at all the flat grass, at the stuffed rabbit in my hand, then at the dark trees crowding maliciously, my thoughts came back and forth between what I should do. I made up my mind. I had been trained to help people. It was hardwired into my system. There was a child somewhere in the woods. I raised my foot to take a step onto the path and that's when a white flicker of movement entered the very edge of my flashlight beam. It was Mary Walker. She was naked and walking stiffly, unnaturally, her arms swaying out of sync with the rest of her body, like a puppet being manipulated by somebody who's not an experienced puppeteer. Hello? Her voice called out. Anyone there? That's when more shapes came into view behind her, shambling along. Here, the bearded man who must have been Mary's husband. Then, their little girl, owner of the well-loved rabbit, both moving as strange as their wife and mother. And now, I could tell there were more, many more. Their forms out of the direct light but so many they caused the darkness to pitch and swell with their strange, staggering passage. Their voices a chorus. Hello? Hello? They called. Anyone there? Echoing back the questions I was asking only a few short minutes ago when I approached the abandoned car. I took a stumbling step back, away from the woods and the approaching figures. I ended up tripping onto the walker's car, but at that moment, I shone my light up into the pitch recess of the branches, and in doing so, I could just make out, barely, a sort of darkness figure that was crouched, hidden in the upper limits, a void even darker than the trees. Was it my imagination? Those lines of pure blackness that extended from that concealed mass that seemed to pierce the flesh of Mary Walker and her kin and the countless other shapes moving in sync with them. That's when I sprinted back to my vehicle. Engine still running. Hello? I shifted to reverse, keeping enough of my head to avoid running off the road as I completed a three-point turn. Anyone there? I took a glance in my rearview mirror. The pale form of Mary Walker stood still just at the edge of the forest where the trees met the road. One hand was raised, signaling me to return, or perhaps waving goodbye. Her face was a mask of confused sadness. I pressed the gas and drove back the way I came. I didn't look back again. The rest of the trip was a fog. At some point after I made it back to the interstate I called my parents. I let them know that I wouldn't be getting in until late. I drove on autopilot, the traffic jam having cleared while I was off. I thought about calling 911, but I didn't. What would I tell them, and to what end? There was no one left to be helped. 
I try not to go through life with too many regrets, wondering about what if, but this one, this choice, what if I had left earlier in the day, what if I hadn't stopped for dinner, maybe I would have still gone left, maybe I would have been there in time to help the walkers, maybe I would have been taken by that black thing that was fishing in the darkness, what if I had gone right, would I still be ignorant? going through life, unknowing that there are these things out there. I try not to think of it too often, but every now and then, all these thoughts turn to the stuffed rabbit. It wasn't until I reached my parents' house that night that I realized I still had that rabbit clutched in my hand. I used to wonder, before men brought our roads and civilization, what was the wilderness like? What lived there? But I don't think about these things no more. I can't afford to. At least, if I don't want to wake up screaming. There are things out there in the woods, in the darkness, in places that humans still have not ventured out to. So be careful when you're out traveling, going into these country roads, and that no matter how bad the traffic is, always stick to the interstate. I grew up in Winslow, Arizona, but also lived for a period of time on the reservation near the Puerto River. My grandparents have a home which is more to the east and not all that far from the New Mexico state line. When my mother and aunts were children, they lived further west. Their house was in a wooded area, and though there were neighbors, there wasn't that many. When I was young, I often heard stories of skinwalkers, but never really believed until I got older, and after my grandmother, a Christian woman, not prone to superstition or telling lies, shared with me and my cousins an encounter that occurred when my mother and her sisters my aunts were still small children. They were living at the time in a three-bedroom house, full wood construction, surrounded by a small fence and with chicken wire around the front porch. One night, when all the children are in bed and my grandfather is off working, she is awakened by a noise that she hears outside. She gets up out of bed and in the dark makes her way out to the living room it is then that she hears something up on the roof of the house. She said that she knows immediately what it is. Her first instinct is to go out to the front porch and curse the creature that has picked her and her family as a target. As she makes her way to the front door, she hears it walking around over her head. Then, as soon as she starts to open the door to go out, she hears it jump down by the side of the porch, open the porch door, come up to the steps and ride up to the kitchen window only about 10 feet away from where my grandmother is standing. She says that she is really scared now but as the porch light is on she thinks that she can take a peek through the window and see what is out there. Just as she starts to pull aside the curtain her whole body freezes as if she has no control over it whatsoever. However she can hear just fine, and whatever is out there on the porch starts to scratch at the kitchen window, as if it's trying to get into the house. My grandmother says she starts praying and asking God to make whatever it is go away, and this is before she becomes a Christian. Finally, the creature gives up and leaves. Once it is gone, my grandmother is able to move again. She says she knows it was a skinwalker. Her own mother had often shouted into the night, and her father would shoot with a shotgun into the darkness whenever a skinwalker came around their whole gun. The next morning, when my grandfather comes home from work, she tells him what happened. He takes the ladder and goes up into the roof and discovers a bundle of dry grass and twigs placed there alongside of the chimney. He tells her that the skinwalker my had wanted to start a fire in order to get her and the girls out of the house. 
Later that day, one of the older men from the reservation comes by the house and puts ash over the doorway. Even to this day, my grandmother swears that she knows who that skinwalker was. But what's more weird or strange is that she's never told us. And even now, she won't say who it was. In Arizona, there is an older woman who lives not far from my grandmother's house. She works about halfway to Gallup, New Mexico, maybe about 20 minutes away from my grandmother's house. On cold mornings, she gets up before the sun to start her car and let it warm up before she makes the drive. Her house is surrounded by a dark wood fence, which is about five feet tall. This one morning, as she is making her way out to the car, she hears voices that seem to be chanting and giggling. She thinks they are coming from over by this low hill to the east of her house and back from the road. She walks over to the fence and takes a look, but it's still dark and the hill is covered with trees and bushes. She doesn't see anything or anyone and the voices have stopped. She doesn't give it another thought, goes about her usual morning routine and eventually leaves for work. A few nights later, she is bringing in her laundry from the outside line when she hears really loud music coming from the neighbor's yard across the street. She decides to be nosy and walks over to the fence to see which one of the boys it is, thinking that maybe she can ask him to lower the volume some. Just as she gets to the fence, she sees a dark figure step from the trees on that low hill and make its way down towards the street. It's moving kind of funny, as if it's not accustomed to its own body. She screams, and it starts to run really fast towards the young man playing the boombox. He must have heard her, because she says he lowered the volume. However, when she turns back around to see where the figure has gone to, it's now gone. She says that she was certain that it was a skinwalker. There's an old crow story dating back to the turn of the 20th century about a man and his daughter driving their wagon along one of the back dirt roads of the reservation. They're on their way to the market. The daughter, about 10 years of age, notices an old woman up ahead. She is limping along the middle of the road and mumbling to herself. Just then, her father moves the horse pulling the wagon and it breaks into a faster pace, trawling up alongside the old woman. As soon as the father is in reach, he raises his buggy whip and trashes the woman across the back. Then and there, right before the eyes of the little girl, the old woman withers down in size, turns into a coyote, and runs off into the trees by the roadside. Her father, not in the least bit surprised, turns to her and says, let that be a lesson to you. The canyons throughout the four corners, for those who don't know, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, Nevada fits in there too, are populated with signs and indications of the presence of the ancestors of the tribes native to the area. Most common are petrographs and petroglyphs, drawings on stones, the remains of cliff dwellings, and ancient roads which seem to run to nowhere. There are also man-made structures of stone houses and temples. Most of these areas are accessible to visitors However, they are also monitored by local and tribal authorities which protect them and ensure their preservation. That being said, it is not uncommon to find graffiti and other evidence of disregard for these historical sites. Several years ago, a friend of mine, a local Hopi guide for the tourists, and I are poking around these ruins. It's already dark. But if you are going to go to these places for the reason we go, 
see if there's anything of value that hasn't yet been recovered. You have to go at a time you're likely not to be seen. I have gone to other similar places with this guy and we had some luck with small relics that tourists will buy. By the way, I am Hopi as well. We are only there for a short period when we hear something moving towards the ridge and only a few yards from where we are. My friend takes a pistol from his waist and points it over to the trees. He's calling out in our native language some words we both know and which are generally used to ward off dark spirits. By the sound of things, whatever is out there is getting more bold and coming closer, but we still can't see anything. At the same time, there is this feeling of dread building up inside of me, and I'm thinking too how nice it would be to have a pistol instead of the flashlight that I am carrying. At this time, we're both thinking Skinwalker. But that's just part of who we are as Hopi. My friend then starts backing the two of us towards the edge running up and over our heads. Just then, this sharp yipping sound breaks out, followed by this sustained high-pitched scream which slices right through me like an icy wind. I find myself praying before I realize I am doing it already. My friend is starting to chant in Hopi, his voice filled with fear. We both have no doubt it is a skinwalker, and it is coming right at us. I lift my flashlight and point its bright beam in the direction of that blood-chilling screech. The skinwalker, still in the dark, responds by making this throat mucus-filled sound, a sort of coffee noise. I am waving the light all around trying to get a glimpse of it. Just then, I guess my friend can't take it anymore and starts firing his pistol. The rounds tearing through the bushes. I drop for cover and duck my head, saying the hell Mary the whole time. When he stops firing, I look up in time to see this dark shape run up the sheer slope of the ridge, just to the other side of the trees and brush. We didn't hang around to see where it went, leaving the ruins behind and getting back to our truck. So if you ever go anywhere near the four corners, don't stay past nighttime, and whatever you do, don't venture out into any native man-made structures, temples, or anything related to ancient native tribes. You might just come across a skinwalker. I myself am not Navajo, but my friend is. He grew up around Gallup, New Mexico. He loves to tell me stories about skinwalkers. He knows it gives me the chills. According to him, they are not like werewolves, but are dark spirits that use the skins or even the flesh of anything living that may serve its purpose. They will also use animal parts as totems. For example, they will take the claws from a bear or the antlers from a deer. They are known to come after humans too, but he says that's a native thing and that white people have nothing to worry about. He says the only way to make it stop bothering you is to take away its disguise. The scariest story he tells is about this Navajo trucker that his father knows. Every night he makes the long run to the reservation from Gallup. One night, when halfway there, he hears a loud noise against the front passenger side of his truck, thinking he might have hit something. He pulls off to the shoulder of the road to take a look, but he finds nothing, not even a mark or dent on the fender. So he gets back on the road and resumes driving. But only a few seconds later, he sees something in his rear view mirror towards the middle of the road and moving up on him. And it's not another vehicle. Then. Just as suddenly as it appears, it's gone. Shrugging it off, he goes back to paying attention to the road, with his semi going about 60 miles per hour. He chances to look in his mirror, and again, he sees this thing chasing him, and it is moving fast. Just like that, it's at his driver's door, 
and holding onto the handle and striding along. Then without warning, it turns to him with his dog-like face and dull, dark eyes and smashes in the window. The driver slams on the brakes. The cab of the truck goes into a slide. The trailer jackknifing past him. The whole time, this creature is holding on to the door and reaching in through the broken window trying to grab him. Somehow, the truck comes to a stop blocking both lanes of the road straight across. The driver is so scared, he doesn't even notice the creature is gone and instead throws the door open and runs off into the desert. Now, he must have passed out or something because he awakes with the sun coming up and finds himself huddled by this rock formation. He's dusty, a little dirty, and missing his shirt, but is otherwise unharmed. Sitting there getting his bearings, the events of the previous night come back to him. He gets up to his feet, dusts himself off, and walks out back to the highway, not knowing what to expect with his truck. However, as he reaches the road, he sees it park as neat as it can be there on the shoulder. When he gets up to it, he sees there's nothing wrong with the driver's door window. It's as if he imagined the whole thing. He does notice, however, a series of small scratches on the driver's door all around the handle, as if something was clawing at it. These marks were not there previously. <laughs>